Hey there, fellow foodies. This is Dr. Cassandra Quave, and you're listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. Um, today on the show, we're going to turn back to one of my favorite uh, topics, and that is fermentation. And my other favorite topic or favorite beverage is coffee. So we're bringing the two together. And I have a great guest for this topic today. Um, our guest is Dr. Eric Peterson. He's an interdisciplinary researcher who's worried about food, um, as I think many of us are. A perfect storm is on the horizon where climate change, political instability, and globalization all threaten access to our food for everyone. Um, as a professor at INRS in Quebec, Canada, Eric spends most of his time obsessing about the circular economy and trying to turn food waste into alternative proteins through fermentation. Um, somewhere along the way, he became an expert in coffee and cocoa. Um, that's also known as chocolate. <laughs> Originally a Canadian, Eric has spent the last decade go doing research in the tropics. Um, he was a professor in Columbia for five years, which brought him to close contact with rural farming communities um, and also enabled some of his work on sustainability for tropical agriculture. It's so great to have you on the show today, Eric. Thanks so much for coming. Oh, happy to be here. Pleasure as always. Yeah. Well, I came across your recent paper that was titled Aromatic Yeast Interactions and Implications in Coffee Fermentation Aroma Profiles, which is very exciting um, to me as a topic. So why don't we start there a little bit about, you know, what you're studying in this domain of coffee and fermentation? Sure, sure. Well, I mean, the first thing that uh, when I start talking to people about this is that they don't, many people don't really realize that there's a fermentation step involved in coffee production. There's also mm -hmm. one in cocoa production as well. And uh, this, this plays a really important role on the, on the sensory uh, attributes of the coffee that we drink, how it tastes, how it smells. Um, so, uh, and so what we, we call this post-harvest processing, and uh, there's a lot of research now that's being put into understanding uh, how this happens uh, out there in the field. Great. So, well, coffee and chocolate are both fermented products. How does, how does this whole process work? How does fermentation work on the coffee itself? I mean, are these, are we adding microbes to the coffee or is this coming naturally from the environment and how do you control for variability if it is natural? How does all that come together? So that's, um, that's a great question. Uh, there's a lot of uh, natural microflora out there that normally forms the the uh, basis for this fermentation. You think about how uh, you know uh, these fermentations were originally invented. They just made a heap of beans somewhere, and then afterwards, oh hey, it tastes really good. I don't know why something happened in there. So it's a spontaneous process that takes place. Uh, but so there's two different ways of processing coffee. There's dry coffee and uh, dry processing or natural, where they spread them out to dry and there's no fermentation. Or there's a wet process where they wash the beans and they remove the pulp and then allow them to sit uh, for about 48 hours uh, and the microbes uh, um, will clean the beans because they're left in the slimy mucilage. And so the, mm -hmm. the microbes will actually consume that mucilage, which then makes it easier to dry the beans. But at the same time, these microorganisms are changing the flavors of the beans as they go along through various different ways. Cool. So how do you, as a scientist, how do you detect these changes in flavor? Are there chemical analytical tools that you can use to, to track this? Oh, absolutely. But I'm just, uh, you know, a, a, a simple microbiologist. I have, <laughs> I have friends who are very good at analytic chemistry and they have very expensive machines which can peer into the coffee beans that I fermented and tell me, you know, what all the different chemicals are that are present in the coffee bean. And uh, let me tell you, it is complex. There are multiple different factors at play for all that, the things that have to happen to, to create that you know, impact when you have your first cup of coffee in the morning. Nice. So I think, you know, so many of us enjoy fermented foods. I mean, and fermentation can be driven by bacteria or yeast mm -hmm. um, and other fungi. In the case of coffee, is there a certain, um, maybe a certain group of yeast that's more predominant or is there a certain genus of yeast as a microbiologist? What have you seen in the diversity of, of fermenting microbes? Sure. So uh, there are, in the last couple of years, there have been a lot of studies that are coming out now on the microbiology of these fermentations. Uh, but generally, um, when we peer into these communities, uh, there are two main groups of organisms that are present, uh, lactic acid bacteria and yeasts. 
So, uh, and they kind of work together in this mixed microbial community. Uh, the, the lactic acid bacteria, which you may know from other types of fermentation, like sauerkraut mm -hmm. or kimchi, they mm -hmm. acidify, so they bring the pH down. So that's a really good way to tell, to watch for your fermentations is the, is the pH change. This can also sometimes generate some heat, so you can see that happening as well. Uh, but they're pro predominantly there to lower the, the pH and preserve this, the food before it can be spoiled by undesirable organisms that are like molds and other unpleasant things. But on the other side, the yeasts, uh, they're also in there and yeasts are uh, remarkable at producing uh, aromatic compounds as well. They do this mostly as a form of, sure. of microbial, um, microbial uh, defense against uh, other, other types of uh, organisms. But to us, they end up tasting uh, a wonderful, you know, and it, it's funny, it's just like, how uh, chili peppers are designed to not be eaten, but we want to eat them anyway. So this is, yeah. a, this is a defense structure that that we now use to impart all these wonderful different aromas into the into the fermentation. In the in the food world, there's a lot of discussion, especially well for 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 grapevines or for coffee around this concept of terroir yeah. and yeah. how the land upon which organisms are grown um, can really influence the final flavor and and outcomes of those food products. And I'm wondering. In your opinion, you know how how big of a role do the native yeast play in in forming terroir? I mean, do you think that they're kind of a critical part there, or 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 not? Uh, so um, yeah, there's a lot of diversity in yeasts, uh, and multiple different players are all coming together. Uh, and now these players do show up across the tropics. You know, like the same organisms will likely show up in Indonesia as they do in, in Colombia or Africa in that tropical equatorial band where most of the coffee coffee is mm -hmm. grown. Now, what really draws them out are the handling practices and uh -huh. how you ferment it afterwards. Because there's and now, you know, there's all these uh, artisanal fermentations coming out with different styles, like anaerobic fermentations or honey fermentations, where they've done things to manipulate the fermentation in such a way that it it encourages these organisms to thrive that are producing all these special uh, aromatic uh, compounds. Interesting. Um, so you, you spent a lot of time in the tropics. I'm wondering if you've ever tried Kopi Luwak in, yeah. in Indonesia. I, I, I traveled to Sumatra, I don't know, many years ago. And I was, yeah, I had a chance to taste this. And for the listeners who aren't familiar with Kobiluak, maybe can you explain how it's, oh, how it's produced? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So this, this coffee is famous because it's eaten by the civet, which is like a cat in Indonesia. And so afterwards, after it's passed through its digestion, they collect those beans and make that out of, uh, make that into a very uh, high priced coffee. Um, that what, what the argument being that as it passes through the digestive tract of the animal, it gets fermented and it becomes even more rich. There's also another one called a uh, black ivory coffee, mm. which is the same pr principle, but fed to elephants. So, yeah. Ooh. So you can, yeah. So that, that's another one. Um, I have tried Kapi Luwak. I was just in Bali, um, a few months ago. Uh, my wife's from Singapore. I've lived in Singapore for years, so I love that part of the world. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah, the Kopi Luwak is uh, it's very um, delicious. It's rich. I mean, I wouldn't be able to to like pull it out of a like a blind taste test of different types of coffee, but it's um, uh, I, I have tried it. You, you have to try it if you're uh, <laughs> if you're uh, if you're bold and curious and you will like coffee. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It is interesting. It's kind of like, yeah, you're getting it from the end part of this digestive process, but in a way, I guess it's, you're really using the microbiota and the acidity of the animals, you know, digestive tract, the stomach to strip off those, that mucilage that you mentioned earlier in the episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Around the mm -hmm. coffee. It also kind of uh, tr uh, triggers uh, enzymes present already in the bean because the beans are living things as well and they start mm -hmm. to activate themselves and degrade themselves and this also plays into the chemistry because those degradation products uh, uh from that are stored there for the little embryo to grow they can also uh, uh when roasted they make all some really interesting nutty and uh, toasted and toasted flavors in there as well nice so, so far we've been talking about mature coffee. So you have these beautiful bright red cherries of the coffee beans that are, that are harvested, but I'm also aware there of a, of a process with green or unripe coffee processing. What can you tell us about that and how does fermentation play a role there? 
Sure. Um, so uh, green coffee beans are the commodity that gets sold all around the world. Um, so what happens is you pick the cherries and they go through the whole uh, uh, post-harvest process, whatever you want. They get dried, they put in a bag and they get sold. And those that commodity there is the green coffee bean. Oh, so they're ripe. They're not unripe. So I'm, yeah, I misunderstood. Okay. Good, but they're okay. what they are, they're unroasted. They haven't been roasted. Unroasted. That's what they mean by right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so then those get sent all over the world. And so, uh, um, you know, when you are drinking coffee, it was, it was shipped as green beans and then arrives to where, wherever the location is. And then some roaster there uh, uh, will, will convert it into, cause they don't, they don't keep so well once they're roasted, you know, they're easy mm. to ship when they're green. Um, so you can, you can get your hands on these coffee beans. Anyone can anywhere. You don't have to be a farmer in 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 one of these uh, regions that produces coffee. Uh, and you can you could potentially directly do a second fermentation on these commodities to modulate the fer the the fermentation process even further. Some people are really interested in this because it's a way to up upcycle low grade coffee beans into good coffee beans because there's a whole spectrum of different uh, qualities of coffee from commodity to specialty beans and there's a cupping score and the higher the cupping score the higher the value so if there's a way to improve this uh, then there's a way to increase the the value capture for these for these and, and increase the profit margins for coffee distributors so I have no idea what a cupping score is. <laughs> Can you tell me, like, what does that mean? When is that like sure. a like an interpretation of the quality or the flavor? Well, there are some people out there that are really highly trained in sensory attributes of coffee. You can there's awards and competitions, and these people mm -hmm. get paid a lot to tell people what coffee smells like. They're kind of like uh, sommeliers for. Okay. Coffee. Uh, coffee. And, okay. Yeah. And so what you would do is with these, these coffee testers is you would, um, it's not quite the same as making a cup of coffee, but something akin to like a hand pour where you make a loose, a loosely ground coffee. And then you do things like you smell it and you taste it, but like wine tasting, this isn't for drinking. This is, this is just to kind of get the, the sensory attributes and then they, they have a score for it. And, and the whole economy around coffee revolves around these cupping scores. And the higher your cupping score, the more money you get for your beans. And that's why artisanal farmers are trying harder to make higher quality beans. There's a drive there to, to provide mm -hmm. the uh, global north with their demand for, uh, you know, designer beans. Designer beans. So in your, in your research laboratory, I know that you experiment with coffee and with yeast can you explain to us like what is it like what what is an, a standard experiment like when you're trying to evaluate how different yeast affect the outcomes of these coffee right. fermentation right. process so uh, like i said it's complex because there's a lot of different species in there it's a it's a mixed microbial community with with yeasts and bacteria and and how do you deconstruct all of that and, yeah. and are like so you could take out one yeast and and study how that one yeast grows but then if you put it in combination with another lactic acid bacteria or another yeast how are they going to interact and and how is that going to change the the performance because this is a lot closer to reality of a, of a fermentation rather than this reductionist approach of just zeroing in on the like a special this is the special yeast that does everything there's a, it's it's complex and so uh, you have to come up with microbiological approaches where you can uh, test many different combinations, you know? So um, let me, let me ask you a question. You uh, have, you, can you name a yeast? I, I know only about pathogenic yeast, like oh, Candida, okay. Albicans or Oris or Paracelsus. Okay. Yeah, Candida, Candida. Yeah. That's, that's a mm -hmm. good one. Well, not, not for pathogens, I guess. Not, but, it don't what make you sick. I don't know what who to make for, a good coffee. For baking. <laughs> baking or brewing oh like uh saccharomyces saccharomyces cerevisiae okay. the most, like the most probably the most important yeast uh in in history for making bread making beer it's also really present in uh coffee strains in no coffee way. yeah it's, wow. a, it's the dominant one but there's all these other little yeasts that also uh, the nice thing about saccharomyces cerevisiae is it's a very messy eater so it grows mm -hmm. really fast, but it makes a, it makes a lot of waste when it's when it's producing. And other yeasts can utilize that waste, and then they can grow, and then they mm -hmm. can add their own special flavors in there as well. So we're we're looking at how when you cultivate um, specific types of yeast with Saccharomyces, some produce 
uh, one type of aroma profile and another group will produce a different type of aroma profile. And we're able to peel that apart. And up to now, people haven't been really looking at that in fermentations. So they've been looking at pure cultures, but now we're trying to find ways of understanding how uh, these mixed cultures can, can influence the, the fine tuning of the aroma profile of coffee fermentation even further. Interesting. So I've, I've heard of people in the natural products world working with mixed cultures through, I believe it's called a Boynton apparatus, where you kind of have two, two flasks with a semi-permeable membrane to allow for transfer of small molecules between the two cultures. Do you use something like that? Or, or is it, or is like, how do you, how do you look at exchange or you just have many, many test tubes with many, many different combinations of these yeasts. Pretty much, pretty much a lot of test tubes. Yeah, you know, we just throw them all in together and see if they play along nice or not. Uh, and okay. so, um, but what we'll do is there are multiple different strains of a specific organism. Like, like we're talking about Saccharomyces, there are hundreds of different types of mm -hmm. Saccharomyces cerevisiae out there. So if, you so if you collect a group of these aroma yeasts and you cultivate each one of them individually, with Saccharomyces, and you can see that they all kind of cluster in one area when you look at the, 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 the PCA analysis, so positive composite analysis. So you can look at these clustering mechanisms. You can see like, wow, when I do all these cultures with Hansenia spora, they're all over here and they look, they're making mint and cherry notes. And then if I do it mm. with like Pichia kudria sevi, oh, now we're getting banana notes and some, some floral notes as well, right? So you can it's it's a numbers game, and then you kind of look at it statistically to kind of see where the where the, the clusters lie in 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 the behaviors. So interesting. Kind of so is is your work in some ways kind of translationally motivated? I know you're really a big supporter of kind of upcycling and looking for ways to reduce waste in the food system. Is that is that your kind of where you hope this research will lead? That this will help us to produce well, better beans. You got to pay the bills somehow. And <laughs> True. Coffee, cocoa are luxury goods. You know, there's a lot of money to be made uh, in these in these industries. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was working in Singapore for the Singapore government, doing multinational uh, research uh, for for um, multinational corporations that are interested in in these types of fermentation approaches. So yes, it's very translational. It's very focused on industrial uh, applications with big, big uh, food companies out there that uh, um, are very interested in applying these approaches so that they can bring consumers um, products that are, um, are uh, you know, what, what they're looking for. Uh, uh, you know, I have research as well that focuses on circular economy and waste valorization and working with farmers in, in rural communities because I want, to, I want to contribute to those things. But yeah, the other side of, of research now is this, the commercialized uh, element, mm -hmm. element of and uh, um, that's that's why the kind of research I was doing uh, in the past. That's great. No, I, I just to be clear, I don't have any problems with translational research. I think that this is actually more of what we need um, because I think, you know, we have to find real solutions that are economically viable to really help move um, move economies into a more sustainable kind of mindset and sustainable oh. practice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's important. Yep. Um, you can so, use these approaches to, to produce like microbial protein or all sorts of great products that are kind of done the same way that you do a coffee fermentation, but you do them uh, with different goals in mind, which for me is like generally typically trying to generate food sources from things that normally we wouldn't want to eat. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about chocolate because I know you've also worked with the Thea Bremo cacao. Yep. That's the chocolate tree. Um, my shirt, but I got little co cocoa pods all over my shirt. Oh, right. you have cocoa pods in your shirt. That's amazing. <laughs> I like it. Dressed to impress for the interview. <laughs> um, so where we, 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 we've talked about how, how fermentation is important to releasing these incredible flavor profiles in coffees, but is the same principle, does that also hold for cacao? Like, is that also important to the quality of chocolates that we then receive down the road? Absolutely. 100%. Uh, if, if anything, it's more important than with uh, coffee and it's more complex because uh, there's there's more things in play, uh, specifically when I was talking about heat generation and enzymes in the beans. This happens a lot more in cocoa where the and that's where you get that rich cocoa flavor uh, taste. And so, you know, 
there's there's multiple different places where you can get coffee around the world. 85% of it comes from West Africa, from Ghana, which is where I got this shirt visiting Ghana, mm -hmm. for, uh, Ghana and co uh, cocoa farmers. The lowest quality coffee comes from Indonesia because they don't do any type of fermentation whatsoever. Whereas in Ghana, they do a, a pile fermentation and that makes mm -hmm. it a, that heat makes it a um, uh, much higher quality but the top the tippy top quality comes from south america ecuador colombia these countries this is the uh, the ancestral heart of cocoa and those are where you get like the really fancy types of chocolate bars so for the for the cocoa piles i know like i've i've eaten just raw cocoa off off the tree in in peru now of course not the actual dark you know seed part yeah, the nib because that's right. incredibly bitter but the white pith that's mm -hmm. doesn't have that grieve a taste, but it's it's kind of interesting to know like on. It. I like it. Yeah. Um, so when you talk about fermentation in this context, are they breaking open the cocoa pods or are you just piling up the pods intact in these large piles in Ghana? Like okay. how are what do these piles actually look like? I'm okay. just trying to paint a picture. It is done differently in different countries, but in Ghana, what everybody does is everyone from the neighborhood comes over to one person's farm and they collect all the pods, they crack them open with a stick reach in pull out all the pods and then make it make it make the beans into a big pile of those so pulpy, the beans, white beans. Mm -hmm. yeah. and then what and then that sits they sit that for about seven days uh, with mixing occasionally uh, at the start all of that pulp which i find very nice it's sweet and floral and when you make a huge pile of it it kind of creates a juicing effect which drips off into and they collect it in a bucket next to the oh. pile. and then you can mm -hmm. drink that it's it's wonderful and nice. they, even, they even ferment that into a wine and a gin, which is also wonderful, I must say. <laughs> That's but, not, okay. I um, have to add that to my must must drink uh, bucket list. This is, yes. This is, there's a funny story here. So I was drinking, I was on this field visit and I was drinking this juice that had just come out of this cocoa pot bucket. And uh, the microbiologist on another microbiologist kept up was like, hey, I just did the counts on that. You should know that the enterobacter count is very high. I'm like, <laughs> which is the bacteria that typically make you sick if you're traveling, if you know what I mean. I'm like, you could have told oh, me that. Oh, traveler's before diarrhea. I, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> before I drank it, but uh, fortunately I was okay. But there was a moment where me and some other people drinking went like, oh no. But uh, this okay. is what happens when you travel with microbiologists. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> Gin kind of balanced it out in the, in the end. Yeah. It. You have to wait for more of that alcohol production to happen uh, later in the fermentation process. <laughs> That's great. So, so this, this kind of, this white pith kind of forms this juice that can then be fermented to make added value products. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. When, what's the, what's the key that kind of tells people, okay, the pile's ready now to dry, or is that the next step in the process after it's fermented for seven days? Yeah. I mean, so they, they've got a pretty good uh, rhythm down to what they do. And it happens pretty consistently uh, that, you know, it takes about seven days. You can watch the temperature like kind of peak. You can look, uh, it kind of gets up to even 50, 60 degrees. So it gets quite warm uh, mm -hmm. from all the microbial activity growing on that pulp. And then as it starts to taper off, they know it's done. Uh, that, that part's pretty pretty consistent actually it always kind of happened the same way what's less consistent is the drying afterwards because now you've got to spread these things out on a big mat in the sun and hope it doesn't rain and and, and oh. it lots so so this can yeah. really uh, influence the quality of the cocoa as well because uh you know you don't want to take too long to dry or it could it could get moldy and so, mm -hmm. so the the drying is one of the more more sensitive things. The other thing people don't think about is that like wine, the cocoa beans need to age. So if you let them sit in, um, you know, in a warehouse, as they often do when they're getting shipped, that gives the beans time to age and become a, like a little bit more oxidized. And that really adds to the rich cocoa flavor notes that you get in cocoa beans as well. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So I know you're not a chemist, but I'm wondering within both of these plants, you have this crazy high mixture of xanthine alkaloids, your, your stimulant alkaloids, caffeine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and cocoa, you have theobromine. Yep. Um, so does the fermentation, do you know, does the fermentation also affect the availability of those alkaloids of those bitter stimulants or. Right. So we've looked into this, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, being part of a biologist is understanding the chemistry of the systems that you there use. you go. Uh -huh. I'm just not very good at using the really complicated machines. Okay how much chloroquinolactone is in there, but there, there are these 
these, there, so in coffee, there are things like uh, chlorogenic acids, chloroclinolactone that are very responsible for the bittering tastes that you get uh, when you drink when you drink a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. And so when you ferment these green beans, you can actually slightly lower those uh, those amounts. They do get metabolized by the by the uh, microorganisms. And so what this does is it makes the coffee a little bit more mild, which is great if say you have uh, gastrointestinal problems, you know, then uh, this is this coffee, if, if, co if you find the coffee upsets your stomach, there's less chance that this is gonna happen with this, this fermented green bean instead. Nice, nice, nice. So out of all the places that you've traveled across the tropics, um, what's your favorite source for both coffee and for for your cocoa mm, okay um well don't go to colombia for coffee that's my recommendation everyone okay. thinks you go to colombia <laughs> and get amazing coffee but they export it all so you know i drank a lot of instant coffee for the five years that i was living in in, <laughs> in colombia you can go to the farms and buy some nice beans but don't expect you know, a nice latte or, or, or things like that. So, but if you do go to Colombia, I highly recommend going to the grocery store and buying as much chocolate as you can, because it is very, very good. It's the locally produced, well, within Colombia, and it's the highest quality uh, cocoa beans you can get in the world. So uh, wow. for, for cheap, you know, so that's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, fill your suitcase with Colombian chocolate and bring it home. <laughs> and you buy the Colombian coffee here in the U.S. <laughs> or yeah, Canada. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can, let me ask you a question. What kind of coffee do you drink, Cassandra? Oh, man, I'm so bad. I just drink anything. <laughs> I, 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 I'm embarrassed to say, like, I have, like, the pre-ground Folgers right now. But <laughs> my husband is a big coffee fan, and he's like, I have to do better than this. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. his birthday was this week, and I got him, like, a home coffee grinder. So he's going to start, nice. you know, yeah, he's Italian, so he's very particular uh, about his coffees. And he's just been suffering along with me, you know, when I do the grocery <laughs> shopping. So I think he's, he's taking back control of the coffee. Coffee, so we'll see what comes uh, out next. <laughs> you know, like, uh, uh, the Italians love their coffee, but and they claim to yeah. own it, but really it comes from other countries, you know. And I have some yeah. examples here. I wanted to show you. Oh, some yeah. Stuff. I'd love to see the examples. So I, I get my coffee from a roastery in Montreal called Zab. Uh, and uh -huh. I had this, this ordered in. Um, but there's some good examples of some different coffees. Like, for instance, we've got two here uh, one from Brazil and one from Ethiopia. And nice. so um, the Brazil is uh, a dry uh, ferment, uh, not a fermentation, but a dry process. And so like a lot of the time with these, they'll tell you these are single origin coffees and they'll tell you where it came from, uh, what the farm was, uh, who produced it, the altitude that it was grown wow. at, the variety of the bean uh, and, the, and the process. So in this case, it's, uh, it's uh, naturally depulped. So this is a natural process. They spread these out to dry. And then the roaster has put that the uh, uh, aroma notes for this coffee are brownie, nuts, and cream. Ooh. So uh, that's, that's, a, that's a natural process. Now, uh, a different example here is the, uh, the wet process. Uh, again, so this is, it tells you all the same details of who did it and where and at what altitude, but this was a washed or a fermented one. And uh, unlike um, the, the, the dry, uh, Form, which was brownies. This is a uh, raspberry uh, pamplemousse. Sorry, it's in French. It's grapefruit <laughs> Great. and and, flor and floral notes. So you can see this is very fruity, whereas that whereas this variety is very uh, chocolatey and chocolatey and nutty. Fruity. Oh, nice! You, know, you can smell them, and you can smell the difference. Like, yeah, this one does smell fruity, and this one does smell um, nutty. Um, but I mean, I have to just draw the the caveat that it still tastes like coffee. Uh, people think that like, oh, it's going to taste like raspberries. I'm like, no, it still tastes, it's coffee with these subtle notes afterwards of, of yeah. raspberry. I had a friend, there was, uh, I learned, I was doing this coffee fermentation in Singapore and there was a coffee shop downstairs that would sell these single origins. And that's where I developed a lot of my palate. And I brought one of my friends there and they, they ordered a coffee that had a gummy bear, a, a aroma notes of gummy bears. And they were expecting it to taste like, and they try it, bah! This coffee, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, that's what it is, you know. But somewhere in there, they get pretty creative with the 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 bouquet of these of these coffees. <laughs> but but uh, from a broad perspective, you you really can uh, taste, it. and sometimes it'll just surprise you when you're like sipping a like my coffee. It's like getting a little bit cooler, and all of a sudden, I can taste notes of like cardamom or cinnamon. And I didn't nice. put those. I didn't put those. Yeah. In, you know, so uh, you have to like kind of cultivate the palate to do it, but. 
And the other thing is, it's not hard to make these kinds of coffees. Anybody can do it. You just, you know, like I started with like a little, a little hand grinder, a little, uh -huh. Japanese, little Japanese hand grinder that you can use for growing, um, for, for grinding up your beans. And then just like a, 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 a you know, a, a hand pour for filtering. Filter. You just grind the beans and you put them in there and you, and you let it. Oh, nice. So That's it's very really, fancy. Yeah. Really fancy, but low tech as well. Low I tech. Mean, yeah. Yeah. The only thing that I've really invested in is uh, a, a good coffee grinder because that actually does make a difference in the quality of your coffee. And uh, frankly, I was getting tired of like hand grinding my coffee every morning. I was like, oh, I have to do this. It was limiting my coffee intake, which may may have been better in, in the long run. But <laughs> now I'm now I'm a high octane state and I'm drinking coffee all the time. And that's great. <laughs> that's great. So when you talk about a good coffee grind, like. How how fine do you like your coffee? Because we've we've talked about like basically, uh, well, this is where you're passing hot water through the coffee, um, but you also have other forms of coffee consumption, such as in espressos or mm -hmm. Turkish coffee, where other plants like cardamom are added to it. Sure. So, what can you share about the quality of the flavor combined with these different? preparation styles because you're you're starting with coffee beans i guess prepared either fermented or not but there's yep. so many different ways it can go so many so that. many so let's just put aside the flavoring elements because that's kind of like a little gauche to coffee uh, connoisseurs we don't <laughs> okay we don't add anything <laughs> into the coffee you know that'd be like adding some no, vanilla things. syrup you know a little okay. syrup to your wine you know just to make it a little bit nicer like oh how i would never do yeah. that but, but um so if you were i mean it, it really depends on what kind of coffee beverage you're producing uh, sets in motion several different things. Roasting, for example, uh, if you want an espresso, you want a dark roast. The most, mm -hmm. uh, the darkest roast is an Italian roast, and they roast it so much that the bean turns purple. It's almost like a little, it looks like uh, like it's been carbonized or it's a little piece of charcoal. You know, it's been it's been zapped into pure like a rich cocoa taste, right? Whereas if you want to taste the acidic and floral notes, you want to roast it less in something like a, a city roast or a light roast. And this mm. keeps it more acidic, but allows some more of those, those aromas to, to come through uh, as well. And then um, the, the, for the preparation, you, like you fine grind is typically for espressos. Uh, a coarse grind is more for hand pours. And you kind of have to dial it in yourself for where what you like and uh, uh, but 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 generally uh, the the roast diameter is is specific if you're using a special machine fine if you're using a hand pour you want it on a medium and I think with the percolator you know the old uh, Italian style ones those which I've used those for years as well uh, they uh, they they also uh, require like a, a certain grind yeah yeah. Oh, so many different ways to take this one ingredient and transform it. That's what's so cool is it all starts as like this little plant and yeah. And the end it's always coffee, but the quality and the, the, the flavor profile and the style can vary mm -hmm. so greatly. It's something that we really love, but you also have to consider that like a lot of people around the world, their livelihood is defended, depending on these beans as well. Right. And we talk about things like, uh, you know, fair trade coffee beans and like making sure that farmers get a fair share for it. But at the end of the day, they're still not getting paid that much for all this coffee that we love, we love to drink. And so this is, it's a, it's a real catch 22 because you can't say like, well, I'm going to stop drinking coffee because farmers are being exploited because then the farmers are not going to have an income anymore. Right. But, but at the same time, it's like, well, you know, you're looking at corporations that want to maximize their profit margins while paying the farm, not paying the farmers more that's a little bit, you know, questionable as well. So I think that it's, it's really complex and it's a really high visibility target because um, coffee and cocoa, but, but uh, it's just something that I think we really need to be aware of, uh, you know, and uh, check our yeah. privilege a little bit when we're yeah. uh, drinking our coffee that we got to understand and our chocolate, you know, how much work people put into this wonderful thing that we love to enjoy. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, the ethics of, of, of the coffee and, and chocolate industry is, 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 is there are many challenges, I guess, from your work in the tropics, what would, what do you think some of the economic factors are? So we know we have kind of large multinational companies that, that, you know, sell many of these products, but 
is one of the issues also that we don't have on site roasting facilities is it sounds like a lot of the fermenting and stuff is happening in country, but then it's shipped out of country as a green bean unroasted. And that's where the value really comes in is after roasting. Am I understanding that right? Absolutely. Yeah. There's a huge okay. value capture for suppliers and roasters, typically in the global north, that actually, you know, capture most of the value from from this uh, compared to the commodity beans that get bought at the farm gate produced by the farmer who really did the the hard work to to mm -hmm. really uh, uh, to, to get this to, to this state. Uh, I mean, so if you look at uh, cocoa production, you know, there's only three main uh, uh, country or companies that that buy beans from farmers and sell them around the world you know so there's there, it's really consolidated into three big uh, distributors of coffee beans and then they sell them to chocolate companies you know and there's there's five big chocolate companies i do, do you think you can you can name any of the the big chocolate companies of the world well i know there's nestle right is that one That's okay <laughs> i don't know the others i'm failing the test <laughs> it's like uh, so Hershey. Uh, Hershey. Hershey's known. Hershey's okay, known. Hershey. Oh, you're on a roll. Um, what about Giardelli? I don't know if that's like a brand or if that's an actual yeah. like maybe. Belgium. Belgium's a really important uh, chocolate site, but it's not one of the big uh, companies. It's not for for. Uh, yeah. For so, uh, Mondelez is another one. They're uh, the okay. people that like Cadbury, to Toblerone. Oh, okay. Uh, Toblerone. I know yeah. those. Those are tasty. Okay. Uh, and Ferro Rocher. Uh huh. Rocher is another one. And uh, the last one's Meiji in uh, Japan. So those oh. people produce the bulk of the world's chocolate that we eat. Um, uh, and so you can just kind of see how like it's gone from like a, like a diverse base of different farmers rapidly into consolidated stru power structures that, that, that mm. the, have a, a, a profit structure around selling, selling these beans. Uh, and uh, and so, but people hold them accountable. Uh, so this shirt that I'm wearing, I don't know if you can see the, the logo on it anywhere, where it says that it's a uh, Coco Life. And so, mm -hmm. and so, um, I'll stand up. Yeah. There you yeah. Go. Okay. Coco Life. Coco Life. Nice with your. So mm -hmm. Coco Life is a initiative by uh, Mondelez for their farmers in Ghana to try and you know uh, 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 help farmers to. Uh, uh, increase their means of uh, economic gains, uh, increase sustainability, provide, you know, access to education. So, uh, you know, I think it's good to keep pressure on these big companies because they do invest. If, if they see that consumers care about this, they do invest in, uh, in supporting these communities and making sure that that they're uh, that they're taken care of, and and so I, there's uh, it's it's nice it's nice to see that there's always more work that needs to be done on this, but but there there are uh, there are initiatives. I mean, I also this is another uh, brand of coffee. This one's from uh, Bali, and so this, this is um, produced by uh, a initiative that helps farmers. They produce biogas uh, for manure and they use it as a fertilizer on coffee and cocoa, and then they sell these coffee beans for the farmers. To try and help them, uh, uh, you know, sell these these uh, these high end coffees as well. So there's lots of little initiatives like this that really try to help farmers, and I work with them as well to uh, try and uh, improve their sustainability techniques and 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 really uh, you know in increase the quality of life uh, for the people that are actually you know, at that the are actually the doing yeah that have to make the advance the the investments in land and labor. It's it's. It's it's kind of wild to me that so much is made off of the trade of these products, but actually the creation of the core ingredients through farming is is so undervalued. I mean, and things are only going to get harder. I mean, right now we are suffering massive heat waves throughout, you know, Europe and the U.S. and beyond. Um, you know, it's it's like 104 degrees. Um, yep. Fahrenheit right now in, in, in the village in Italy where my husband's from. And I'm like, this is really hot. That's yeah. really hot. No, and so what's, you know, there are, there are going to be consequences from climate change to our ability to grow these crops. Plus we have a pretty yeah. low level of biodiversity when it comes to coffee and, and cocoa. Mm -hmm. Um, what are your thoughts there? I mean, are these industries at risk because of, of the factors of climate change and low biodiversity? Absolutely. Um, what, do you, what do you foresee? For multiple reasons, they absolutely are uh, at risk. Like I said, most of the coffee and cocoa is produced in the tropical equatorial belt, which is especially sensitive to climate change and mm -hmm. high temperatures. So, um, you know, this the, uh, the, the global south where most of this is produced is 
identified at a higher risk for climate change. And again, when you're talking about smallholder farmers, a lot of these products are produced on like a couple hectares by a farmer and they, they get sold mm -hmm. and collected. You know, all of these issues, uh, um, there's a lot of social economic issues that really limit these farmers as well. And, and climate change exacerbates that. Even things like inflation and like how like the cost of food, right? Like it's becoming more and more expensive and, and they really feel the pinch. I, I've got family in Colombia and they tell me that people are really feeling the pinch from uh, from the price of food. And, uh, you know, but the, the price of commodities aren't are like the, the, the price that they're buying or selling their beans for isn't increasing, but the food is getting more and more uh, expensive. So finding ways where they can increase their self-resiliency and, uh, you know, uh, take care of themselves more, uh, be adaptive in the face of climate change. I'm writing projects on that right now. That's great. Try and, try and um, you know, uh, work with the these people because, yes, I want, I, I want to make sure that we all have access to coffee in the future. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I'm, I'm just thinking beyond feeding their families, there are also challenges in rising prices for the chemicals that it takes. Even if it's organic agriculture, there's still a, an expense to protecting these plants from disease. I, mm -hmm. I was working um, this past winter in Egypt and visiting a number of smallholder date farmers in, in the Western desert of Egypt in a small oasis. And they're having horrific problems right now with the kind of like larval insect that just mm -hmm. gets into the date and just destroys the date. And I'm, I'm, asking them, well, what can you do? Like, well, we have this bottle of basically it's a kind of pesticide, but they can't afford enough to actually protect all the trees. So they limit how much they put in and then it doesn't always work. And so they're seeing big parts of their date orchards just dying off. And yeah. this is a, this is something we've seen over and over again. We've seen this with citrus as well, right? With citrus greening, um, where we have a lack of diversity and factors from climate change and pests it's 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 just a recipe for disaster right absolutely, absolutely. i i do know that there's one site in colombia very close to where my family lives where they have a a, a biodiversity uh, orchard so to speak or a plantation mm -hmm. of maybe they have like 65 different varieties of coffee on this plantation. amazing that's they rare mostly, yeah yeah it is very rare it is a very special thing now most of the time it's like the, a few cultivars that do the bulk of the production but they have they keep these reservoirs because they understand that this is a natural mm -hmm. heritage and a treasure that they're that they can draw upon potentially to look for pest resistant or disease resistant uh, crops because you're right all of the fruit uh, crops all, uh, fruit trees out there are all horribly sensitive to to insects and pests the other thing that we're doing like i said is we uh, digest uh, manures or food waste into natural gas for cooking in the home but then it also mm -hmm. produces a series of fertilizers organic fertilizers as well so they're able to turn the re residues uh, into something that so then they don't have to go out and buy fertilizers just like they have to do nice. for, for, the chem for the pesticides as well so yeah. there are things that can be done uh, and it's and a lot of it's about education people want to do these things they just need help need training uh you know it's it's not hard but you know to get out there and really make an impact you gotta you gotta work smart and work with uh initiatives and and uh you know uh, get local involvement into play to like make sure that these things actually really take off the ground that's amazing well i've learned so much from this episode from from speaking with you and i know our listeners uh will as well thanks so much for coming on the well, show Eric. Uh, it's always a yeah. pleasure yeah and um is there anywhere I can send folks like to, on your social media or to um, a website so they can learn more about your work? Yeah, please do. I mean, you can look me up on Twitter at Trash Prof. Uh, that's uh, if you want to just uh, get in touch with me. Uh, you can also just uh, Google my name, Eric Peterson at INRS, and you'll see my professor webpage, which has uh, links to my articles and research and uh, student opportunities. If anyone's interested in doing uh, grad studies in, in these types of work, I'm always looking for bright young minds to uh, be the next uh, generation of uh, leaders in science. Amazing. Like if I was applying to grad school right now, I would definitely <laughs> want to join your lab because you're doing really cool work across the globe. Well, thanks yeah, so much, Eric. It's not hard when like, you uh, convince someone to go to Columbia or Bali. It's fun. <laughs> it's great. 
You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious, recorded for you today on Restream. I want to give a big shout out of thanks to our show's producers, to Rob Cohen and Christine Roth of Co-Conspiracy Entertainment. I also want to let you know, if you'd like to support the show, you can go over to our swag site. We have lots of fun things, t-shirts, bags, um, coffee cups um, at mysterycontrol.com. And I want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in each and every week. It's great to have you um, here with us. Stay healthy out there, and I'll see you next time.